Hello and welcome to this video which accompanies my latest blog article on matthewsadler.me.uk on activity and Zugzwang in endings. I wanted to do this uh, little video uh, because I recently prepared a training for some juniors about endings and um, well when you have to explain something about endings to um, uh, yeah to younger players uh, who haven't got so much experience with it um, it often helps you an awful lot to formulate your ideas your general ideas about endings in uh, in a nice clear way and um, I was quite happy with the way I did things so I thought it might just be nice to um, uh, to share this with you I mean why do you have to study endings that's uh, always the uh, the eternal thing I mean we know we have to uh, that's what Capablanca said but what's the actual value of it as far as I'm concerned the the value of studying endings is that it actually helps you to understand how to activate each of your pieces and to combine them very effectively in uh, middle games um, you've always got an awful lot of pieces hanging around so if one of your pieces isn't doing very much you can uh, always compensate for that by uh, taking another couple of pieces and uh, and doing something in a different area however um, in an ending you haven't got an abundance of resources so you really have to make the most of what you've got and activating your own pieces um, is a huge skill in endings and actually then uh, you know very logically as well restricting the activity of your opponent's pieces is also a great skill I just wanted to demonstrate this first of all just with a, a very trivial example you know king and rook versus king it's very easy of course um, but the um, uh, the key thing about this position is is how you actually do things and how you actually do things is you um, you actually restrict the activity of the opponent's king to the greatest degree. Um, it's uh, you gradually take away squares from the opponent's king until he's forced to move to uh, to the corner. And what you also do in order to create the mate, you actually increase the activity of your own king to the maximum degree. Um, it's this beautiful combination of uh, king and rook, because without the two without the white king in an optimal position and the white rook in an optimal position you'll never be able to deliver mate. Um, another interesting example of, uh, of this is this ending king and pawn versus king. If we just uh, advance the pawn up the board we're not going to achieve anything in this position. What we have to do is we have to get our king as active as possible and this will actually drive away the black king away from the queening square which enables the white pawn to queen. Again it's all about maximizing the activity of your own pieces. Save that and move on. Now this is a beautiful uh, example of this activity and coordination. The Lucena position, a very famous position, and one that uh, well every player should know. Um, it's one of those endings that does actually arise uh, in uh, in practical play. So looking at the position, you can say that uh, White's king has done a sterling job, getting all the way to d8. Pawn's on d7, so the king will, will actually want to get out of the way in order to allow the pawn to queen. But look at the struggle that's going on. I mean, the king on f7 and the rook on c2, the black pieces, they're doing an amazing job of keeping that king penned in. There's very few pieces, but there's this enormous struggle going on. So how does white proceed in this position? Well, I mean, the first move is obvious. You give a little check and you drive the king away. But now it gets interesting, of course. Um, I mean, how would white want to do? I mean, white would want to move his king out of the way and queen the pawn. But then black's got this typical, oh, I'm terribly sorry, this typical uh, way of uh, uh, holding stuff in endings. He just gives checks all the way through. And if the white king goes too far away from its pawn, then the black rook simply wins it. So how should white win this position? 
Um, well, what they always say is that, um, you know, if you're not sure how to improve your position, talk to your pieces. And, uh, well, if we talk to the king and the pawn, I think they'll both feel that uh, they're doing all that they can in this position. But uh, if you talk to the rook, I think he'd look a little bit embarrassed because he's not really pulling his weight, or not enough anyway. Um, I mean, the, the key thing about rooks is that they're most active when they're effective both along the file and along a rank. Uh, and this is particularly true in endings where lots of pawns and pieces have been cleared away. So the rook can actually, has actually got a lot of freedom to, um, uh, to, to get involved in that sort of uh, active position along rank and file. And in this particular position, there's a beautiful way of coordinating um, the rook and the king, as long as we activate the white rook to the, to the maximum degree. And it's this famous move, rook f4. Um, when black waits, which he has to more or less, then we bring the king out. And as the checks continue, we come back to here and then we combine rook and king, locking the black rook. And after the exchange of rooks, there's nothing black can do to stop the pawn from queening. Um, standard manoeuvre, but uh, the basis of it is maximum activity for both white pieces and combining them together. So, Let's see another example of maximising the activity of the rook. Um, this is a position from Grant Arkell, always look to Keith when it's uh, rook endings, uh, which I actually quoted in uh, Chess for Life, which I uh, co-wrote with uh, uh, Women's International Master Natasha Regan. Um, in this position, blacks are pawn up and uh, doing pretty well. His rook's also very, very active. It's um, beautifully placed attacking the pawn on a2 and also uh, tying down the rook on b2 to its defense. And the rook on a4 is actually also stopping the, the white king from getting any further from the third rank. But of course, you can always improve uh, stuff, can't you? And uh, there is actually a very good move in this position, and that's rook a3. Um, what we're doing in comparison to the previous move is we're actually um, stopping the white king from moving any further than the second rank. Now, what is uh, Black's plan in this position? Um, actually quite simple. I mean, Black's plan, he's got a kingside pawn majority, so he's going to create a passed pawn on there. That is essentially what you do in endings. You create passed pawns and you queen them. The interesting thing is how Keith actually did it. Um, it's obvious to push your F and your G pawns in, uh, in this type of position, but that would actually just lead to creating a passed pawn that's isolated. You know, you basically swap off your G6 pawn for the G2 pawn, and the pawn goes down to f3. What Keith did was uh, was very nice, I like this very much, he swapped off his h pawn for the g pawn, um, which meant that when he pushes his f and g pawns he gets a protected pass pawn on f3. I'll just whiz through those moves and show you because it's a very nice idea. Here again the rook staying on the third rank, uh, the king's moved all the way over to b2 to cover the a2 pawn and now the rook's moved over to h3 and attacking the h2 pawn. And now the king is coming back, and the rook moves over the other side. It's very, very nice. I like it. Uh, I like that very much. But here we are. Here the pawns uh, come along, and what you see is um, by swapping off the h pawn for the g pawn, the g and the f pawns advance, protecting each other. And that's uh, well, that's very, very nice, very important, and very, very strong. And Keith won in a few more moves. So that's uh, something about the activity of the rook. Let's now have a look at the um, activity of the king and uh, take a famous example here. And this is uh, Capablanca against Tartakova, uh, which is a game I saw a very, very long time ago as a child. Never forgotten it, actually. Uh, I just uh, set up the position just like that. Um, what's the position here? I mean, black's king is pinned to the back rank and white's rook is, is sort of lording it over the seventh rank. Um, but, you know, by itself, that doesn't mean a great deal. I mean, as we've seen in this king and rook versus king ending, you need to combine king and rook um, in order to make any threats against the black king. Rook on its own is not always going to be able to do something. And although black's king is very bad, his rook is pretty active. It's uh, on c6, it's attacking the weak pawn on c3. 
what Capablanca did was 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 very very nice. I mean, it's just um, a typical example in rook endings. The king sacrificing pawns, anything to activate the king. This move is also very elegant, pushing the pass pawn and uh, uh, freeing a path for the king into f6. And here, this is a, a very nice move again. You um, you don't want the king to be driven away. You want it to be invulnerable on f6. And by leaving the pawn on f5, we ensure that the black rook hasn't got any of those annoying checks that we saw in the Lucena position. Um, and uh, here, white's threatening mate. And uh, after king g8, rook g7, here, well, Capablanca didn't take uh, too long in uh, in winning this position. He's just got uh, fantastic pieces. So again, this uh, activity of the king worth a few pawns, and especially this idea of combining king and rook together. That's how you make threats against the opponent. And that's actually the, the point of this position, which is another very famous position, which is the Philidor position, uh, black to move. Um, as we can see, the black king is restricted again, just like in the previous game, Capablanca, Tartakova. Um, there's a rook on uh, b7, which pins it to the first rank. But that doesn't actually mean anything unless white manages to combine his king um, with that rook. Um, and also the pawn, of course. Um, and that's why the most important move in this, uh, in this position, um, which uh, is something that really does crop up in uh, practical play, is rook a6. With this move, white, black just stops white from activating his king and combining that with his, uh, with his rook. And if white tries to secure a square on f6 for his uh, king with e6, then black goes back to rook a1 and we've got our standard checks from behind. If that pawn was still on e5, then white could hide with king e6 and have decent winning chances. But um, with a pawn on e6, there's no hope at all. It's just perpetual check. But again, that's a case of trying to uh, prevent the opponent's pieces from combining together and also making sure that uh, that your rook uh, stays active. And this is another another game, funny enough, that we uh, that we quoted in um, in uh, Chess for Life. I could have picked actually quite a few examples of this. It's a very common idea. Um, I think first of all we should have a look at what uh, the opponent played in this position. I mean, White's pieces are incredibly active. Kings on h5, rooks on c1. Uh, the rook is tied on d7 to the pawn on c7. And when um, black just played just rather normally, um, then um, actually white was just winning. Uh, the threat of uh, rook e8 check um, followed by winning the h7 pawn is just huge. What black should have done was uh, again to play to restrict the activity of the white king. As long as white king and rook are not combining uh, together, then black has chances to survive. And that would have been this move rook d2 takes rook h2. Um, it still looks very scary for uh, for black with that pawn on f6, but actually this position is drawn. Um, and it's all about keeping the king, to bring, sort of pushing the, king, the white king away, making it go back and getting the black rook active so it can keep on harassing the uh, the white king. It's a very typical idea in rook and pawn endings to actually uh, just sacrifice uh, um, a pawn in order to activate the rook. And actually, though, the key point is to make sure that the opponent's king stays uh, more passive and doesn't doesn't actually combine with uh, with its rook. Now, one thing that uh, that's funny about uh, endings that I hadn't actually you know really fully consciously realised, uh, bizarrely enough. As I listened to um, an excellent uh, Sergei Tivyakov uh, chess-based DVD called, I think, Converting Advantages, um, one of the th I hadn't actually realised that Zugzwang is just so important in endings. I mean, used it many times, but uh, hadn't quite occurred to me. And also how odd it is. I think that's the main thing. Because after all, with Zugzwang, what it means is that um, you spend all this time getting your pieces into the optimal position, and then just at the the moment suprême when uh, you think this is the time you strike actually you just wait and then just wait for the opponent's position to fall over and that's very that's very very interesting and i think you can best uh, illustrate that with uh, this uh, famous last game alakin against uh, against capablanca um it was the last game of their world championship match and alakin played a, an absolute stunning game um in order to win it and well capablanca put up a hell of a fight too 
Um, in this in this game, actually, Alekin wasn't quite completely thematic, um, but he did point it out later in the game, the, the completely thematic variation. I mean, here you've got the Black King, which is tied down to uh, stopping the a6 pawn. You know, Black can't take that a5 pawn because the White King is so far, it'll just gobble up all the kingside pawns. Um, but actually what you want to do here, what White wants to do is to just tie down the rook to the defence of the f7 pawn from its current position and then he's just going to wait and wait for black to run out of moves. And the way to do that was to play this move, I'm terribly sorry that's what uh, Alekin played, was to play this move king g7, attacking the pawn on f7. Um, the idea there is that, well, black's rook is tied to the f7 pawn. So white's going to do just a, a tiny little dance there. Here, just uh, he's just ensured here that uh, black doesn't have the f6 square anymore for uh, for his rook. And after rook f5, he plays f4. Now black's got no more moves um, to uh, uh, from which he can still defend the f7 pawn with his rook. So his rook's got to stay where it is. But yeah. What else can he do then? He can't play f6, he can't play g5, and if he plays uh, a move like king b7, we just play a6. King a7, and we just wait. King b8, a7, king a8, and we just wait. And in this position, black's got no more moves, he's going to have to start shedding pawns. And uh, of course that means the game. It's um, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a weird concept, but um, but this concept of Zugzwang is uh, is actually you know crucial for so many endings. But um, it can just uh, if you haven't really thought about it before, it can come a little feel a little bit strange. You think, yeah, you know, I put all my pieces in such great positions, and instead of striking at the end, all I'm doing is waiting. It's um, it's quite uh, quite funny. So there we are. That was my uh, my enormously quick tour through um, the value of activity and Zugzwang in uh, in endings. I hope you uh, you enjoyed that. I hope that um, sort of um, uh, gave you a few uh, a few ideas. I, I, after doing it, I sort of felt that uh, oh yeah yeah these are all things I uh, I knew you know but um, this sometimes it's just very good just to uh, you know just like a beginner just to go through the basics again and just repeat all the things that uh, that you know unconsciously. And uh, I think that sort of knowledge can uh, can really help you play uh, play endings well in your own games. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, the um, the full version, uh, the full article is available on Matthew.me.uk, and there's also uh, a downloadable version of uh, of this of all the games in this uh, in this video.